right. Good afternoon, everybody who's joined so far. We're just giving it another minute to let a few more people join in to the presentation, and then we will get started. I think we'll go ahead and get things rolling here. Uh, we'll probably have a few more people pop in uh, as the presentation gets started. But uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Uh, my name is Sam Worst, and I'm a member of the Illuminate Engineering Society and the co-chair of the Education Committee for the local IES Raleigh chapter. Uh, I'd like to welcome everyone to our presentation, LED Drivers Matter. Uh, we have a great discussion lined up for you today. But before we get started, just need to cover a couple housekeeping items. At the bottom of your screen, you'll see a box for Q&A. Feel free to submit questions throughout the presentation and we will address as many of those as we can at the end of the presentation as time permits. Uh, lastly, all of our presentations are recorded and archived on our YouTube channel, uh, www.youtube.com at IES Raleigh 2221. Uh, that link will be available um, elsewhere as well for you to find these presentations, uh, past, present and future, and uh, recommend this to your colleagues as well. So, um, Today, we are happy to welcome Michael Link of Acuity Brands. Acuity Brands is a lighting manufacturer based in Atlanta, Georgia. Acuity Brands has decades of experience in manufacturing high quality luminaires in North America and abroad, and their portfolio of brands have illuminated projects across all sectors of the construction industry. A little bit more about Michael. He has over 25 years of industry experience and now serves as the director of sales for Acuity Brands. His journey into lighting started all the way back in middle school, where he worked as a crew tech for the high school's production of Little Shop of Horrors. So I'm sure that was a fun time. Uh, from there, he went on to get a degree in theatrical lighting from Lehigh University and worked on several venue designs during his time at George Eisenhower and Associates before making his way to Acuity Brands. So with that, uh, Michael, I will hand it over to you to start the presentation and appreciate you taking the time to join us today. Great. Well, thank you guys. Welcome. Um, hopefully this will be a educational hour for everybody. And if you, as, as Sam mentioned, just feel free to throw questions in and we'll happily get to them at the end. Um, a few housekeeping on the uh, CEU side of things to to touch through here. Um, so this is an AAA approved uh, health, health, safety and well, uh, welfare uh, CEU. Um, so there are some basic things we have to touch, uh, touch through as we go. Um, so officially, um, on the official side of things. So uh, just a confidentiality statement. So the content shared in this presentation uh, is not intended for reproduction distribution without uh, our permission. Um, as I mentioned, this course is an accredited presentation with the American Institute of Architects. Um, so this course will, uh, when you at the very end of the presentation, uh, will uh, give you an opportunity to request a certificate um, to receive credit for um, for uh, for this presentation. Um, so you can use that for self-reporting, or if you are an AIA member, it will be reported directly uh, to, to the AIA. Um, so on the course description, you probably already read this in the, intro, in, in the uh, advertisement for the session, but uh, just the formality piece for AIA here. Um, so LED drivers matter. Uh, their quality, capability, and intelligence drive the results of our lighting design and empower lighting controls on your projects. This course will provide an in-depth review of the driver's performance specifications to deliver quality of light, dimming, flick, dimming with flicker-safe capabilities, and lighting controls, including luminaire level lighting controls. Um, with, uh, with this, there are four learning objectives. The first is to recall key attributes of the LED, of LED drivers. The second is to review industry standards and codes that guide dimming, flicker, color tuning, and additional applications. The third is to describe a variety of control technologies and how they relate to LED drivers, performance, and specifications. And then the fourth is to 
build an LED driver performance checklist to help you identify and specify key attributes to enable your projects indoor, out, indoor and outdoor and for any application. So it's a lot to cover. Uh, we'll try and uh, keep on schedule here to uh, to get it all. Um, but it's uh, a lot of jam-packed uh, details in this presentation. So we're really here to talk about why LED drivers matter and why what you're specifying really impacts your projects and, and can make or break your success. So let's dive into it and we'll explain why uh, this is a fact. So when we look at the anatomy of a, of a LED luminaire, we start with the basic housing, whether it's rolled steel, whether it's extruded aluminum, many different types out there today, but it's the actual housing, what contains our, our, uh, our, the, uh, the rest of our fixture. Um, then the second piece would be our LED engine or our light source. Um, you know, these can be round, square, long, linear, or strip, very different uh, types of, of, of light engines. But here we're just talking as a very generic term, whether it's a chip on board or whether it has multiple different LEDs, all just thinking about this is where the output of the fixture, the lumens are actually generated in this case. There then is an optical solution or some method of diffusion generally. Maybe it's a reflector or diffusion over that. Maybe it's a secondary optic, like a TIR optic in a spot in a spot fixture or such that's shaping our light. Um, so we have the optical solution as the third part. Our fourth part would be any controls or sensors that go into the fixture. Maybe we just have simply a zero to 10 volt fixture. And so there's just zero to 10 volt coming into the fixture and our controls are external. But maybe we have actually an uh, occupancy sensor on board on the fixture, and we're doing some intelligent controls at that point. A lot of different options here, but it's the next part of the anatomy of the fixture. An emergency driver. Perhaps we need emergency in this case for this fixture, where we need that uh, either 90 or 120 minutes uh, ride through power through, through that um, to be able to ensure that an emergency operation, the fixture is still operating. Um, so that could be an additional part of our fixture. And then our last but not least, oops, I don't know how I just went backwards. My apologies. Um, much great. The wrong, very interesting. Touchy today here. Um, our last piece is our LED driver. Um, I like to think personally of our LED driver as the brain, um, but some are not very intelligent. Some are very intelligent. Um, but that LED driver is really the brain and the intelligence in the fixture in terms of that it takes in whatever input power is coming in, whether it's DC, whether it's AC, it then regulates that to the exact current um, or voltage that the LEDs need to produce the desired lumen output of the fixture. Um, so it is that and that point that connects everything either together and makes the actual fixture work. Um, in the past life, we often thought of this as a ballast in the fluorescent world. So if you remember fluorescent ballast, LED driver is pretty much similar, uh, but generally, generally tends to have more silicon and more advanced technologies based in it. So, um, so we when we consider the full assembly here, probably the most important piece, uh, other than your LEDs, would be the actual driver itself in what it is making making the fixture actually work. So what uh, what driver uh, is in the luminaire that you're specifying? So what are we thinking about? What is the most important part? to talk about here. And the first thing you should consider is the quality. And that relates to the quality of the output of the fixture, the quality of the light. Um, the driver handles that power conversion. So it's very important, obviously, that it's getting that correctly aligned uh, to control the LEDs. Um, it's very important that the power is properly regulated, right? We don't overheat things. We need to make sure that we're not driving the LEDs at too hot uh, or, too, or, or too high of occurrence where they're going to cause color shift or degrade the LEDs or maybe shorten the life of what we'd expect for that luminaire. Very important. Um, we also need to make sure that uh, they provide features that would help prevent any issues, whether it be surge protection, uh, short protection, uh, over, uh, over, you know, over output, thermal protection, things that will, will allow for us to make a more robust fixture that's not gonna be damaged by things externally. The driver is also very important in terms of dimming the light output to achieve the right light level. So it controls the actual dimming of the LEDs and the output of the fixture. And then the third one that's really the big biggest one today is flicker. Um, so flicker used to be something we talked about years ago with, with fluorescence. We kind of stopped talking about it for a while, but it's really important to think about today um, is that something that's long been a challenge in the lighting world 
um, but it's come back to be a bigger challenge with LEDs as well. So we need to think about visible flicker and how that impacts people. And the driver really is the key part of controlling that. So the second thing to consider is the capabilities. And what is that driver capable of? So when we talk about luminary design, we have to think about the importance of the expectations of, of, of what we're trying to achieve from that light. So the first one, when we say on off, so it's the on off behavior. So when I turn a light on, just a basic kind of light switch, right? My expectations is when the light switch goes to on, the light fixture comes on right away. There's no delay, there's no ramp up, that light goes on right away. I was just actually in a, in a hotel uh, this week that had fluorescence in it, uh, older fluorescence. When I turned the light switch on, I'm pretty sure it was about 20 minutes later before I got the full light output, right? That's not a desired result in that space. Um, so the on off uh, is, is very important. Um, so that we're getting to that level. Uh, we also wanna make sure that if we have multiple lights on, on a circuit, that we're not getting a popcorning effect or they're not coming on at different, at, at, at different times. So one than the other than another want them all to come on at the same time. We also want to make sure that they come on at the right level. So if I have a dimmer and I bring the dimmer up to 50%, I want my all my fixtures to come out at 50%. I don't want some at 20, I don't want some at 30, some at 60. So it's very important to make sure that that is the right case. And then when I shut it off, I want them to go all the way off. I don't want them to go to almost off and then stay on for just a little bit and then go off like there's some current left in that. We saw that with very early uh, LED replacement lamps where there was some a residual current in, in the fixture and it left the light on for a little bit, even after you turn the power off and then it eventually went off when it consumed all that, uh, basically draining capacitor style. So another uh, thing to think about too, is that these are kind of regulated uh, by a couple standards. So with on off, there's a standard related in, in California title 24 and with energy star, the require the provide requirements that call for the first light to be turned on in less than 500 milliseconds and, and the time to full brightness to be 750 milliseconds after the, the user initiates the on. So there's clear standards out there for that. So it's important to think about that. Uh, when we talk about color tuning, um, it's been a major request um, in, the, in the commercial market to look into color tuning. And so it's important to know whether the, the, the driver can actually handle that and match the behavior of traditional light source like an incandescent or halogen where it's a dim to warm type of scenario um, or an accurate CCT allowing it to track in a flexible space if we're trying to move a fixture from 27 to 3000 K or, some, or something like that. Um, so the LED driver manages those control signals and so it's important for that to be uh, specified. Consistent behavior and performance is also a big part of that, right? We want it to do the same thing every time. Um, so it's really important for us to, to, to know that that's going to happen. And that brings us to the third consideration, which is intelligence. As luminaires and more importantly controls um, become more a part of everyday life in commercial lighting, the driver has become that facilitator. I mentioned it, the brain earlier, right? So it's very important for that to be able to handle that. Um, so when we talk about below here, this diagram, in this case, the controller on the left is speaking a language or protocol to the LED driver. That driver then has to make that translation from whatever the protocol that's being spoken to it to actually create the right current going to the luminaire uh, or to the LED engine in the luminaire to actually drive the LEDs correctly. So it's very important that we know what our control protocol is and our drivers matches that so that they're receiving the right signal and they can understand it. It'd be like if my controller was speaking or if my control was speaking German, and my driver was expecting English, we may have a lost in translation moment there. So it's very important that those are aligned and that they can handle the same thing. Um, so you see the drivers have been changing quite a bit over the years and rapidly advancing. Um, so it's important to consider all of these things on your projects. When we think about breaking these down a little bit more, one of the most important things I mentioned, right, is Flickr. Um, so Flickr is an increasing concern um, in, in the workplace. Um, you actually hear when we talk about return to office a lot about, well, I don't, the lighting really gave me headaches or the lighting wasn't great for me. Um, it gave me fatigue and things like that. Um, lighting has a tremendous, especially artificial light, impact on people's human bodies um, and through really perceived through their eyes. Um, so Flickr causes concerns like headaches, fatigue, blurred vision, eye strain. Um, it's also been linked in some cases to neurological problems 
um, including things like epileptic seizures. Um, so it's important to think about this and make sure that we are not contributing to those. Um, the nice thing is there are standards out there that help us with this, not just for the human body, but also for camera recordings. Um, you know, unstable light produces uh, vertical stripes in a video or film recording. You've often probably been watching a, a football game or something, and you see the scoreboard has kind of these lines going across it or kind of the scrolling artifact of vertical stripes. Um, that's generally created by Flickr, right? The camera is not succinct to the video board's uh, wavelength of light being distributed. So we actually end up with that Flickr in that case. Um, so sorry, it's not wavelength, it's not frequency. Um, so that creates that that um, artifact, essentially. So the um, IEEE uh, standard 1789 uh, has a standard for temporal lighting artifacts. Um, and the I IEEE recommended practices for modulating current in high brightness LEDs for mitigating health risks to viewers is the standard. Um, so this provides um, a lot of details about the challenges and then ways and basic uh, requirements to ensure that you're not providing a harmful environment and that you're using sources and drivers that uh, reduce uh, or eliminate flicker uh, to the visible eye. So it's a very important specification to follow to mitigate uh, these risks. So what a, one of the biggest uh, aspects of causing things like flicker, as well as other undesirable outputs uh, from LED fixture is how we're actually dimming it. Um, so it's very important to think about what type of dimming technology we're using. And by this dimming technology, I'm talking about from the driver to the light engine. Um, and so the most common way, three most common ways are constant current reduction, pulse width modulation, and optimized modulation. So uh, three three ones to talk about. We'll start first with constant current reduction. So in this method, the driver is varying the actual current to the LEDs, but the LEDs are always on. There is always some illumination coming out of the LEDs. The main benefits is that there's no flicker and little noise generated on the line, so little uh, harmonic distortion. There is also a higher LED efficacy in the lower dimming levels versus other technologies. There are some drawbacks to this method as there's poor dimming regulation at the very deep dimming levels where there is low current. So this would be about below 1%. Um, so once that driver reaches that low end, there is potentially some additional possibility for color shift, not always, but in certain fixtures. So it's something to be mindful of, uh, which obviously would not be ideal um, in that case. So, but it's great for regulating flicker, great for regulating THD, um, and it does have that higher efficiency, efficacy. The second method is pulse width modulation or PWM. Um, in this case, this is where the LED drivers are, sw are switching the LEDs on and off at a fixed frequency, essentially as if you would go to the wall switch and flick it on and off. So really just turning them on and off very, very quickly, faster than your eye could possibly see. This does provide good dimming performance at low light levels. However, there are some negatives to PWM. There is potential for greater noise generation on the line, so greater THD. Uh, there's also potential for undesired flicker depending on the frequencies and amplitude uh, of the modulation. So this is where you need to make sure your camera is set correctly. There are some individuals that say they can perceive flicker uh, with pulse mod modulation. I'm not quite sure how many people really can, uh, maybe some of that's more perception. Um, but it is something to, to keep in mind. So the, the third is called optimized modulation. This is where the LEDs are not switched off in terms of an amplitude change and are modulated with a variable frequency, so putting it all together. This method provides the most amount of performance benefits, the best dimming re regulation at our deep levels, highest duty cycle frequency, which results in acceptable flicker that meets the IEEE 1789 standard, and allows us to dim all the way to 0.1% or a term that's often used as dark. Um, this deep dimming level mimics the incandescent bulb. Um, so we get that kind of expected light control. Um, this method also ha increases our efficacies and is very low to little noise generation, so low THD. Um, so as we mentioned and previously on the Flickr slide, the important standard reference here is IEEE 1789 that provides us that best overall performance of LED luminaires. So let's talk for a minute about measured versus perceived light. It's probably a, a, a graph you've seen before, 
Um, it is not any anything new in the industry. Um, but essentially, our lights, our, our eyes, sorry, are imperfect um, instruments. Um, they are they are probably our best a uh, few years at, or few years or few months after we're born, um, and then they get worse over time. But our eyes never see the true or and I, our combination of our eyes and our brain never see the actual value of light in a space. So when you look at this curve, if we dim a light down to 10% uh, measured uh, light, that is about 32% perceived. So in other words, we always think there's more light in a space than there actually is. So dimming all the way to 1% means it's about approximately perceived value of 10%. And if we dim all the way down to 0.1% or essentially off, um, there's still a perception there's two to three percent of the light in that space. So your eye will always think that there's more light. So it's very important to think about when you're using a technology that you can get all the way down to the very, very bottom uh, without having that perception uh, that there's a significant amount of light. Um, so if you ever want to play around with a light meter and 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 an actual uh, a, a dimmer with a numerical value, uh, it's a lot of fun to uh, cheap party trick to to play with your friends to uh, ask them to try and uh, try and guess the light level. Um, so when we talk about ways to handle this, right, um, we want to we want to align our dimmers and our drivers to the right uh, light output so that we don't have these bad results in the perce perception of light. Um, so it's just like a good marriage. Opposites attract. Um, so we want to have the opposite dimming curve on our on our dimmer and the opposite dimming uh, from our driver, which I know makes no sense. We think well, if I got a linear dimming curve, I want a linear driver. But the reality is we want to go the opposite way. So if a dimmer has a linear behavior, which most do standard out of the box, then our LED driver needs to have a logarithmic dimming curve. If our driver has a logarithmic behavior, then we need the LED driver to have a linear dimming curve. Pretty simple to remember, you just want the opposite. Um, that will ensure that we don't have any dead travel. It'll ensure that the perception of light is actually linear uh, versus to be a parabolic. Um, so it's very important to remember opposites attract. Just as in life, the same with dimming curves and LED drivers. So really important to remember. So when we talk just a little bit deeper into the dimming side of things, um, we have to really concern, uh, confirm that our eyes do not perceive brightness the same you know, uh, in the same way. And we want to make sure that we're very clear in how this actually works. So we've got a great example here. So the biggest point of focus is in that low level, that below 10%. So the chart, as we talked about, explains it very clearly. But let's say our dimmer has 20 steps to it. So because it's electrical current, it's not exactly perfect. Um, there's always some level of stepping up of the current in in the as, as we go. Um, so if we have a 20 step dimmer, that's 20 steps from full uh, to off. Um, it, here's an, a couple examples to work through. So let's initiate this animation here and show how this dims. So our first example is with a true linear uh, dimming curve. So we have our 20 steps here along our line. And as we click this, you'll see it progressively getting darker. So what happened about step 13 or 14 in the correlated square? Did you perceive any additional chain, change above 13 or 14? The reality is you end up not. The way that the the, the way that your eye works, right? You won't see that difference over the last range. So we're losing that ability to dim uh, to dim all the way down from a visual standpoint. So when we use a logarithmic curve, the, we actually see it very differently. So we'll walk through the little demo here. So now as I'm at my 12 or 13, I'm still seeing change all the way up to step 20. So that gives you an additional uh, data point here to show that you're getting great, a better dimming range, more, more accurate perception of the light uh, when you're working with that logarithmic control. Our recommendation is that you make sure that the products in the space have the same dimming curve across all. So if you have linear fixtures, if you have down lights, you want to have that same dimming curve so that there's not any differences. And then you also want to keep uh, in mind that the low 
dim percentage um, so that it's the same across those fixtures as well. We don't want something stopping at 5% and something going to 0.1%. Uh, that would be a bad perception in that space. So let's talk a little bit more on, on, on the controls and how we actually ensure that this is specified correctly. Um, so since we talked a lot about dimming curves, and we're going to talk next about dimming protocols, one of the most important things we can think about beforehand is a defining a sequence of operation. Um, I always say that the sequence of operation is probably the most important thing you can actually execute in your spec. Um, so let's define what a sequence of operation is when we relate it to this to a project and to lighting controls. So a sequence of operation is a series of events or things that come one after another in a predetermined particular order. Basically, the set of rules that define how our space will respond to input from a person or a control system. Although the sequence of operation is part of the specification, it's differentiated from the bill of materials. Oops, sorry, advancing slides here accidentally today. Um, as it defines a series of inputs and outputs as opposed to listing devices and luminaires with part numbers. So you may want to consider the sequence of operation as part of your performance specification or a separate table um, on your lighting schedule. So why are we bringing this up in a driver conversation? Well, the reality is that the drivers today are the brains, right? And they're connected to a fixture that is in some level controlled, even if it's zero to 10 volt or very basic, or even if it's just on, on, on and off. We need to define that. We need to make sure that we have a clear startup sequence and uh, an alignment with all of the other fixtures on the project. Because if we have a space with multiple zones and multiple switches, we may we got to make sure that they're acting the same and that they're that they are working together. Otherwise, you'll have very unintended consequences. So when we start talking about lighting protocols, what are we talking about? What specifically is included, you know, in in, in a conversation about drivers? Well, the lighting protocol, simply put, is the language that a dimmer and a controller use to communicate with the luminaire. And as we said earlier, the language is then passed through the driver on to the LED engine. So this is what I mentioned earlier about speaking German versus speaking English, right? Um, so the speech bubbles here rec rec uh, acknowledge that from the dimmer to the driver itself. But there are several different protocols out there today. And probably the most common ones that, that are out there and we'll talk about are 0 to 10 volt, DMX512, and a digital protocol, which is sometimes proprietary, but often based around the DALI standard. Um, and then there are several other emerging standards that we won't get too far into the details, but there are a lot of other ones on the market. Something also to remember is that there's an increasing level of discussion around a concept called luminaire level lighting control or triple LC. Um, this is mandated by certain codes, um, but this talks about the concept of embedded controls, uh, where the controller is actually embedded in the in the light fixture with the driver and the LED engines in one complete package. Um, so we'll talk a little bit more about that here in a second. So let's talk about the the three most common um, standards that are out there today for for dimming. Um, so the first is zero to ten volt. The second being our digital control bucket, including inclusive of Dolly. And our th the third being DMX512. There are obviously multiple protocols that are digital that could fall into the digital category. But, so we'll speak a little bit generally to, to those types of protocols. There are also a lot of new standards that are coming out. Um, and there will probably be new ones every day in this world. So let's talk about the first one and probably the oldest one. Uh, zero to 10 volt uh, predates LEDs. It's been around for a very long time. I remember discussing it many times when we first started getting into the world of fluorescent dimming. Um, and it's probably the most commonly used um, uh, because it is perceived to be the cheapest and easiest uh, to install. So zero 10 volt dimming is analog dimming. There's really no digi digital, digital uh, nature to this at all. You connect it to each fixture and the fixture, the driver is looking for the difference between the zero, between zero and 10 volts to determine the light output. Um, so this is done using basically a single pair of THTN wires. Uh, they are low voltage. So in certain markets, you might have to run them in separate conduit. Um, they may be acceptable to run in your traditional, uh, along with your high volt or your, your 120 volt or 77, as long as you're using 600 volt rated wire. Um, they are generally marked today as pink and purple. That is the st new standard. You probably knew them as pink and gray in past lives, but pink and purple is the current standard. Um, and they'll be connected, obviously, from 
directly from the dimmer to the LED driver. Um, that DC voltage, as I said, varies between zero and 10 volts. Um, so that gives you a lot of freedom. Um, you can actually start in a, in a daisy chain. You can, you know, T-tapping it. There's really no uh, topology requirements with the with zero to 10 volt. Um, so it has, as I said, lower perceived costs, which is why most people uh, jump down this road. Um, but what are the negatives versus more of our, the other two types of technologies? Um, there's no individual control of fixtures. It can be impacted by by uh, noise on the line and cross signals from high voltage cables. Um, voltage drop can be a problem. So if you have a longer run or you hit multiple fixtures along the way, there is some ability for there to be a small voltage drop, uh, which could produce a unintended uh, dimming out dimmed output of certain fixtures. Uh, since you know it's looking for the difference between zero to ten volt. And maybe there's a, a voltage drop. So I only have nine volts on the other side. My last fixture may only ever be at 90%. So just something to remember. Um, and then it's just not as precise. Uh, we can't get down into the very low granularity uh, to the to the below 1% really with zero to 10 volt reliably. Um, so we need to look at more of the digital protocols if we're trying to get too dark or to like a 0.1 level. So let's talk about the digital bucket, uh, which would include Dolly and proprietary solutions in that. Um, so obviously a little bit newer technology, although some of these standards have been around since the fluorescent days as well. Um, so these uh, protocols have some level of intelligence and there's varying levels of intelligence within, within them, um, but they're smart, unlike our analog technologies. Um, they often, and in almost all cases, can drive uh, drivers independently with its own unique address. So in a room, if I have 60 fixtures, I would have 60 addresses, and I could choose to, to, to control each fixture independently, depending on what my uh, control front end is. Um, but digital protocols allow for that, which makes it very flexible and, and adds some ability to rezone or, or recontrol uh, versus my power wiring side of things. Um, many addresses can also be uh, aligned at the same time in banks or blocks. So we could actually create circuits or zone or switch like zoning like we would traditionally. Um, digital protocols also allow for two-way communication between the controller and the driver. So that way I can actually get feedback, carry feedback back to my control. Um, so I could actually use information from the fixture related to Maybe I have occupancy sensing, maybe there's something wrong with the fixture. Um, this that really enables that, not that concept of an intelligent luminaire. Um, so digital protocols do generally require, uh, they need to be uh, daisy chained. Um, so you would have to go from fixture to fixture to fixture to fixture. Um, you cannot generally star them or T-tap them. Um, so there is a topology specific need to that. Um, they often, um, in digital protocols, tend to be proprietary to one manufacturer, um, although there are some standards like Dolly, uh, which does have a certification process so that you could take interchangeable parts from multiple vendors and put those together and, and, and work um, essentially seamlessly. Um, but in North America today, Dolly is not, ver not very widely adapted, um, but the new Dolly uh, 2 standard is becoming more adapted. Um, it does provide a, a clear path of certification. And there's a new um, extension of the Dolly 2 uh, certification program, which is called D4i, um, which the D4i LED drivers have a mandatory set of fixtures related, or standard features, sorry, related to power supply requirements and smart capabilities. So that additional specification step up in that respect. Um, it also starts to allow for the introduction of things uh, in the IoT space um, and more additional feature sets beyond just control of fixture. So I do want to point out though, that just because you go to digital does not necessarily mean I have to unlock the world of IoT and all these additional systems, right? There are very basic digital systems that allow for that fle the flexibility and ease of control uh, without going that extra level um, and the extra levels of complexity. So, um, so you may not need to use any percentage of the features that are available in a digital system, or you may want to unlock those. The third standard, uh, which comes from the theater world, which is where I got started in lighting many, many years ago, um, is DMX to DMX 512. Um, so the DMX stands for digital multiplex. Um, this is a standard uh, that is regulated by the USITT, uh, which is uh, an ESTA. 
Um, so the, the current version is DMX 512A, um, which they, the original senior was just called DMX. Um, so this revision is quite a few years old at this point. DMX has not changed very much as a, as a whole itself, um, but they wanted to provide more detail and clarity to the spec. Uh, so DMX is an AGTM protocol, similar to our digitals. It is a digital protocol in itself, um, but it is very specific in that it allows for addressing up to 512 control addresses. So um, one a white fixture may take one single channel. A fixture that is RGBW may consume four channels. Um, so it's something to keep in mind. So if you're doing uh, color changing fixtures with four channels, you could have up to 128 fixtures on a single DMX universe. Um, so why is DMX uh, an important standard? Why is it coming more in lighting? Well, as we get smarter fixtures, we get into more color changing, more tunable whites. Um, it has a very robust standard related to dynamic color uh, and dynamic controls. Um, so DMX plays very smartly into these types of applications. It can also be paired with a second standard uh, called RDM or remote device management, which provides that two level communication over the same wiring structure um, as uh, as you would expect from more of the traditional digital systems. Um, DMX does require very specific wiring requirements, including a twisted shielded pair. Uh, so there are some additional things to consider there on that side, uh, along with the daisy chain uh, topology. Um, all three of these are very common um, across the US, uh, North America, and you'll you'll probably see them on multiple projects. You might even see them mixed on projects where we have zero to 10 volt, digital and DMX all on the same project. It's very possible. So let's talk for a second uh, about the concept of luminaire le level lighting controls um, or embedded controls. Um, so this is, is part of um, the International Energy Conservation Code or the IECC uh, code. Um, so this is moving us in a farther direction. So it was first introduced in 2018. It was revised in the 20, uh, 2021 version. And there's additional uh, uh, requirements and pieces coming with the 2024 um, version. So these provide basic requirements for controls. And what we're talking about here basically is that every individual fixture is its own smart little entity. They have the ability to control the light from the fixture, both internally or independent or, or from a network topology. Um, you have the ability to do occupancy um, locally at the fixture, as well as having a light sensor uh, capability to do daylight harvesting, and then so setting any uh, basic requirements uh, around a daylight harvesting scenario. Um, the fixture also would need to have the ability to do minimum trim and fade rates. Um, and does allow for remote configuration capabilities. Um, so this is a requirement of the IECC. Uh, several other codes have introduced this. Um, so we are seeing this more and more um, as the 2021 code is adopted across states. Um, and I'm sure we will see additional with the title, uh, with the, uh, sorry, with the year 2024 uh, next year. Um, so if we look a little bit more deeper into a fixture, what does this entail? Right, so when we remember our, our uh, architecture earlier, so in this case, we have the driver as the center or our brain, um, in case we would have a, a, a battery backup for emergency operation, you're connected, we would have a network interface uh, to connect it to the driver um, that receives that input, whether it be of wireless or whether it be wired uh, from other fixtures. And then we would have an integral sensor to the fixture that that sensor could control that appropriate luminaire uh, with either with occupancy and daylight. Um, so in this case, in luminar level lighting controls, you would actually still have, you have sensors per fixture versus maybe one sensor in the ceiling that controls all 12 fixtures in the room. Now the controls are smart and actually in the fixture itself versus most controls today are off board at controlling a fixture via some form of network. So that is uh, uh, one of the bigger, the bigger changes in that respect. So when we think about that, if we're thinking about enabling technologies of the future, Selecting a driver that is digital and has that brain capability is very important to think about. So another technology we often get, uh, get often gets talked about and then often becomes very complicated um, is uh, creating a dynamic white environment or color tuning. Um, so we're not intending this to be the presentation of this topic. It needs way more discussion than I have time uh, to talk about today, but I wanted to just uh, bring this up uh, from, from the basic level here. Um, so there's mainly two schools of thought for controlling dynamic white 
um, in a cost-effective everyday applications. Both involve using two channels of control. The first method shown here is using one channel for warm LEDs and the second channel for cool LEDs. Um, so in this example, the different color LEDs are on two different drivers, uh, which is a very common deployment method. The intensity of each of those LEDs is controlled individually by adjusting the output power with the slider connected to the corresponding dimmer. The CCT ch changes depending on how much light each different LED is producing. Um, sometimes you may need to calibrate this system with a manual calibration to ensure that your, temp your color temperatures are aligned as you're moving both uh, separately. The second example, uh, it once uh, you know, we use one, you, yeah, sorry, one control channel is used for intensity and the other is used for um, the color, color control. So one for CCT and one for the actual intensity of the fixture. Um, this requires a digital driver that is able to process and receive that, and then also control two separate uh, outputs. So it's a dual, dual driver essentially um, in one package so that it can translate that out to the two separate LED colors. Um, this allows for more consistent CCT to be maintained, um, an adjustment while not impacting the intensity of the fixture um, or vice versa. This generally saves cost, makes it simpler to design, and is easy to execute into the architectural fixtures. There is always potential that you may need to calibrate this manually uh, just to ensure that you're getting what you want. Um, but the nice thing about this is this also allows us to control multiple fixtures very seamlessly and effortlessly. So let's talk uh, a little bit more about a, a checklist here um, of how of how things how things uh, what you can include on your projects and what you might need. Um, so when we first talk about this, we talked a lot of, about flicker, right? And or sorry, ranges of incandescent dimming um, is first. So our quality of an incandescent our quality of the incandescent dimming. Um, so we want to be able to dim that fixture down at 2.1 or often known as dorm to dark or at least to, to 1% um, to get as close to that incandescent light that we want. Um, so you want to look for a driver that has configurable minimum dimming levels, consistent minimum dim levels throughout operations so that at any uh, across across multiple fixtures, programmable output currents. Uh, so you may need to think about that if you're trying to get to that. And then high resolution dimming, uh, so there's no visible steps. We don't see like a step dimmer down, as well as ensuring that we have the electronic off capabilities to shut off the driver's lowest output level. So there's several standards listed here. I'm not going to read through every detail of every standard here, but standards to think about and to remember. Um, you know, one of the most important ones here for this is Title 24 and Energy Star, uh, because they have a very clear focus on this performance of fixtures to mimic incandescence. The second, which is probably more the most important one in my personal opinion, other than the visual of incandescent, is the ice flicker. And what you need to remember here is the S or the IEEE standard 1789 uh, re relates to uh, flicker at all dimming levels. There is also a NEMA standard as well that you can look at um, and choose to specify as well. Um, but really, the important thing is no visible or invisible flicker over the dimming range, dynamic or static. Um, and no strob stroboscopic, scrop ooh, talk, can't talk today, I'm, my apologies. No stroboscopic effect when filming uh, with a camera. This is also a requirement of California Title 24, um, but the best reference is the IEEE 1789. Um, we also talk about our controls interface capabilities. So what are our choices of protocols? What protocols can be used with the fixture? So it's very important to ensure that your control system aligns with the LED drivers you're specifying. So if you're using just zero to 10 volt, your fixture needs to, your driver needs to be able to, to utilize that. If you're using a DMX type of control, uh, you need to be able to handle that. If you're using a digital system from a proprietary vendor, or if you're using Dolly, you need to ensure that that is aligned. Um, so it's very important to make sure that that is the case. Um, there is also a, a UL supplement out there that relates to zero to 10 volt, uh, protection against wiring errors. That's actually quite important. Um, that does happen quite commonly uh, where we get uh, the wires crossed on zero to 10 volt systems and damn it and can damage drivers. So make sure that um, you're putting your specifications that you all uh, supplement. When we talk about color tuning, how do you want to execute color tuning? How do you want that to be controlled? So it's important to look at how the fixture 
uh, you know, would respond to that. So what is the driver set up to respond and how is it designed to control? So a dual drive will give you that nice control. Um, you know, the driver with two, two outputs with the dual output would give you that nice control of intensity and color separately. Um, but, or maybe it's better to utilize two separate uh, drivers, but you need to make sure you know what that is and that your specification is set up for that. We wanna ensure that all your fixtures are the same regardless. So the consistent behavior of the, shut, the start up and start and, and the shut down. So we want that no perceivable difference, that popcorning effect that I like to refer to. Um, and that our startup times are between 750 milliseconds and 550 milliseconds um, for indoor applications. Um, the biggest requirement here, again, California Title 24 addresses these requirements. They're also mentioned in Energy Star, um, but it's important to uh, address this with 750 milliseconds for exterior and 550 milliseconds for interior, interior applications. When it relates to interference, right? Um, we've, we've seen this all, we've seen the FCC marks on the back of many things. We want to ensure that there's no electronic uh, electromagnetic interference, no unwanted radiation or conducted interference on the line or space. Um, so our FCC Title 47, Part 15, Class A and B are the important ones to have in your specification here for this. So now there's many other considerations that you could possibly think about um, and, and consider for your projects. Uh, and this is a, a, a fairly good list. Um, surge and, and EFT protection are very, uh, very important. There's a nice ANSI standard out here uh, for this uh, that you can that you can specify. Um, that's going to ensure that you have at least 25 kV um, uh, on on your fixtures. Um, the low power consumption of luminaire is when set to off. So you great specification point of less than 0.5 watts. Um, so a fixture that does have intelligent controls or digital controls will always consume some small amount of light, but we don't want to hear about vampires. I mean, I know my uh, electrical electric company runs these uh, vampire commercials with these scary vampires that says, turn, you know, don't want to have all these lights on, don't want to have all these little plugins that are drawing power at all times that we want things to be truly off. Um, but it's important to think about that for your light fixture. So less than 0.5 watts is the, is the reference standard for that. Um, it's very important to ensure, uh, ensure that. Um, no audible sound. So in compliance with the ANSI standard C82.18 class A, uh, this refers to harm, uh, to audible uh, noise in a space. If you've ever worked on a theatrical project or with an acoustician, they're very, very keen on these things. They do not want to hear anything from drivers. They'll often actually require you to put, uh, and they're all thinking about the old world of magnetic ballast and things like that, um, but they want to make sure uh, that that's not harmful in a space uh, to create any any audible noise. So thermal protection and then ingress protection, two other ones to think about here. Um, thermal protection, and they go out, and in my book, kind of hand in hand, very important, especially for exterior uh, applications where you may have some type of more adverse weather, uh, whether it be hot and cold, uh, whether you might have water in that case. So very important to, to, to think about those and, and make sure you're specifying the right levels there. Uh, for interior, about 20, um, IP20 for exterior, maybe you can consider uh, getting above a 54, IP54, or maybe even into the 60s, depending on what kind of application it is. If you have a lot of dust and, and humidity, um, that might be a bigger concern. On the temperature side of things, it's important that they have thermal protection uh, with an external T uh, NTC uh, thermistor. Uh, it's very important. Um, you also might want to look at the spec range. There are certain places in Canada that require um, down to negative 40 degrees Celsius. Um, that is not generally a requirement in, in most of the U.S., uh, but just something to remember. And then global coverage, if you're working in another uh, jurisdiction, um, that you're referencing those important standards, uh, have the right voltage range. Obviously, parts of Canada use 347 uh, very commonly, um, 12277 really in the U.S., and then obviously 240, 222.40 in the rest of the world. Um, so it's just important to make sure you've got all of those things covered. Um, so there are many, many things here. I don't have time to get into all the details of them. Certainly happy to address in questions or and follow up beyond it. Uh, but just quickly to recap, so why do drivers matter? From the quality side, it's very important uh, from the power and the current to the lumen, to the LED and the luminaire. Very important that we that we uh, that we have that done right. 
Um, our drivers, you know, today are that brain, and we want to make sure um, that we that they are doing that they are regulating things correctly on the dimming side and ensuring that there's no flicker that could be harmful to humans um, or to cameras in the space. It's very important. You know, a great way to test the flicker, honestly, is actually take your your iPhone or your Android out, turn your video camera on, and what you can often see you may see flicker in spaces just by having a video going in that space. So quick, quick test there that you can use. Um, and then we also talked about capabilities. So can they do color? Could they do color tuning? Is that important for your project? What is the right on off um, behavior? Um, you know, ensuring that we have those fixtures that come on when they when you want them on and they're off when you want them off. And that consistent behavior across all my fixtures in a space, very important. A driver really is the key to that. And then intelligence, more and more today. Controls um, are an everyday project thing uh, as we get more into energy codes and just more desires of our um, our our tenants and, and end users. Um, so important to, to think about that now as our driver becomes more the, the sensing uh, control center point for our light fixtures, whether it's triple LC environment, whether we're just looking to embed controls. Um, so very important to think about that. So um, this uh, concludes the continuing education portion of the course. Um, so really appreciate you guys uh, time and, and, and attention. Uh, so we do have some time for questions and after the questions we'll advance one more slide. Uh, well, actually we can, we'll do it as we do questions here. Won't make, you don't ever said we stay, but so to get credit for this course, um, please follow this QR code or go to this uh, quick tiny uh, URL. You'll enter your information um, and this event code, the event code is AB2316-2. That is the AIA registered code. Um, if you do not follow that step, you will not automatically get the certificate um, and it will not automatically be sent through to AIA if you're AIA registered, um, or we will send you a paper certificate if you request it so you can use it for your self-reporting uh, needs. So uh, Sam, do we have any questions? At the moment, there are not any questions in the chat. Um, I have one that I'll ask, and if anybody has any last minute questions, feel free to type them in the chat um, while we go over that. But uh, Michael, one of the questions that came to mind while listening was when you were talking about digital communication and some of the um, capabilities that that adds to a project, sure. uh, one of the things that I noticed was two-way communication between mm -hmm. a driver and the control system. And yeah. as we see the adoption continue to grow of these digital lighting control systems on projects, you know, what do, what do you see as the future state of that two-way communication between a driver and the larger lighting control system? And what kind of advantages may that offer an owner? Sure. So I think that's a, I think that's a, a, a tremendous uh, point to hit on and, and note. Um, so that, two, that two-way communication is really starting to uh, become more of a requirement um, instead of just kind of a luxury. Um, you know, I remember many years ago going into and going to a large office project and saying, you know, hey, I got this great selling point of two way communication in your lighting system. You know, I can tell you when the light goes out on the fourth floor before someone calls you and reports it. And their adage, I think it was 15 years ago was oh, it's OK. No, no big deal. People are used to lights going out. Right. Well, that's not quite how it works today. Right. A light goes out that triggers a maintenance call like right away. People scramble. It becomes a whole big situation. Um, but so two-way communication really does a couple of things. Certainly once the building's operating, it allows for them to know what's going on and, and not only make changes to the control system remotely, but know when lights are out where things aren't working, right? Trigger those maintenance calls in advance. But during the commissioning process or in the startup process is really important because it allows for them to get feedback of, oh my gosh, this fixture doesn't even have power, right? I can't even find the fixture, right? So I need to go send an electrician to tech, tech that out. Or if I have power to my fixture, I can see my fixture, but it's not responding, then maybe it's something else in the fixture that I need to troubleshoot with the manufacturer. So it makes the commissioning process much easier, um, allows for that kind of direct feedback and it's working, I'm not working. Um, but then once the building is operational, it provides a tremendous maintenance feedback uh, capability um, and, and the ability to smart dispatch um, my, my, my workers, which are my most export, important asset, right? Um, so. That's my, my yeah. short answer to that. Hopefully that. Yeah. Uh, awesome. Yeah. Thank you. Well, we haven't yeah. had any other questions in the chat. So um, with that, we will wrap up the presentation here. Um, like Michael said, um, you can use the information on the screen here, this login or scan that QR code to automatically get your CEU certificate. 
If you have any issues with that, just reach out via the IES Raleigh email address, and we can assist you with making sure that you do get credit for this presentation. Uh, keep an eye out on your email for future IES Raleigh uh, webinars and events that we have upcoming uh, towards the end of the year, and, and certainly on into 2024. We have a lot of exciting programming planned for everyone. So um, thank you, everyone, for your time and for joining this afternoon. And have a great weekend. And with that, we will conclude the presentation. Thank you, Michael, again for your time. Thank you so much, everyone. Have a great day. All right. Bye, everybody.